It's called Bad Balloons.
Good morning, everyone. You'll have to forgive me for not being used to doing this on a regular basis. So, uh, and it's great to have you here with us. Um, my name is Brett Tippy. For those of you that don't know, I have the pleasure of serving as one of the elders of our church. Um, and you heard earlier for this, I think, uh, a month ago from Tom Weesey, who uh, filled in for Dave when Dave was away, and now it's my turn. And it is a pleasure to do this. Um, I wanted to go back, John is correct, that right now we're in a series called All In. Um, I'm taking a little bit of a deviation from that at the moment, although now that I think about it, my message is going to be about how each one of you can be all in for the kingdom. So I hadn't made that plan, but here we go. It's actually, I can say it's, it's God's will that it, this is part of the series. Um, so, uh, I wanted to start out by saying today is the 4th of July, so happy Independence Day. Um, and you can see that we're going to be talking about missions, which maybe on the, on the surface you think, wait a minute, those two things don't really go very well together. Um, but go with me here. I'm going uh, to try to uh, put them together in a way that uh, maybe is encouraging to you. Um, so this is the day that we officially celebrate the independence of our nation. Um, the, the, my son Ivan was reminding me that we weren't actually independent on July 4th, but we made the point that we wanted to be independent. And then it took a long struggle thereafter uh, to make that actually happen. And um, it's also a day that we use to celebrate the values and the freedoms that we enjoy, and those are certainly things that we should be celebrating, um, that God has blessed us in those ways. It also stirs up in us deep emotions um, and pride as we use this day to honor the men and women who served, who fought, who died to protect and preserve those freedoms. Um, so if I'm looking out, and I know that there are some of you here who have actually given that sacrifice. Thank you for your sacrifice. Um, and we're going to talk about sacrifice uh, uh, at, for, that missionaries uh, make also as they, as they spread the gospel. Um, but um, I wanted to... Let's see if we can make this work. Yes. Okay, so we're going to call this expats for the kingdom. Uh, and I'm going to break that down a little bit. What do I mean by expats? What is the kingdom? Um, and how does it relate to this idea of celebrating our independence today? Um, but in the year 2000, anybody remember this film? It seems like a whole generation ago, right? Um, so in the year 2000, Mel Gibson starred in the film The Patriot. Um, perfect, uh, perfect topic for today, given what today is. A patriot defends the values and proclaims the virtues of his homeland, just like Mel Gibson did here. He was fighting for his freedom, and he was proclaiming that freedom loud and clear. Um, a patriot finds his or her primary identity as a citizen of their native land. Um, and, a, and a patriot feels a strong bond with his homeland. And when a patriot meets someone else from another country, they often try to persuade them that their country is the best, right? That's kind of what we expect as, uh, in terms of a patriot. But what happens when you remove the patriot 
from his native land, literally take that person out of, uh, out of their place. I've joked around that, uh, you know, um, many of you know my wife grew up in Texas, and you can take the Texas, you can take the girl out of the Texas, but you can't take the Texas out of the girl. Um, so, uh, but I want to give you another example here of removing the patriot from his homeland. So uh, this is dangerous for me to show this here, okay? Um, I recognize that, and I just had, uh, Rachel and I spent a, a week on the shores of Lake Michigan, um, and it, it just passed this past week, a lovely time with Tom and Jara and uh, Gail and John, um, so we, we very much enjoyed that. But um, when you remove the patriot from his homeland, the patriot talks and talks and talks about his homeland, right? So check out this image. You all know it, and you've heard, you've all heard Michiganders talk about how Michigan is what? What is Michigan? Beautiful. Yes. God's country, right, Gail? Um, yeah, so I grew up in Indiana. I'm not from Michigan. I'm not from Ohio. But at that time, there were lots of Michigan college students living in my hometown, going to the local university. And they proudly used their hands, as you all know, to show me where they, uh, where they were from. And then when they said, they said, when I went to college, I went south and I ended up here, right? <laughs> you've, heard the, uh, you've heard these kinds of things before. Um, so they're very proud of their state, right? Uh, they are, in, in some ways, when, when, when you take the Michigander out of Michigan, um, they, all they can talk about is Michigan. They are expats in some senses of the word, or they might call themselves exiles. Um, and those of us who aren't from Michigan, if you are from Michigan, please hear me on this. Those of us that are not from Michigan, we don't have a very long tolerance for all that Michigan talk. Um, can I get a witness, Buckeyes? Um, so, uh, now I will say, it is beautiful up there, but I'll, uh, I'll be honest, when Rachel and I were driving through Michigan, I said to her a couple of times, you know, for all the times that Michiganders talk about how beautiful Michigan is, it sure looks a lot like Ohio. <laughs> um, so, but let's talk about some biblical examples of expats and exiles, and later we'll get into missionaries. So, Abraham, for one. Abraham lived as a foreigner in temporary housing, literally a tent in the promised land, and he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer, or I like the fact that in some translations it calls him the architect and builder, is God. That's from Hebrews 11.10. 10. His hope was in a faraway place. Daniel lived as a foreigner in Babylon, and Daniel loved his home country so much that he prayed three times a day facing Jerusalem, and we all know what happened to him as a result. He got thrown into the lion's den because of his love for his homeland. Um, but they didn't, these two didn't just long for their earthly homes. If we look at Hebrews 11, um, uh, it shows that Abraham and these other heroes desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. So that's Hebrews 11:16. And then we see Peter using similar language in 1 Peter chapter 2 when he, said, when he calls us uh, sojourners and exiles, or in some cases that word sojourner is translated foreigner. So if you feel like a bit, of a, um, uh, a bit out of place in the world today, it might be because, it should be because, you have chosen to let Jesus be king and the world has not. Uh, so that should produce in us a sense of, uh, of longing for the kingdom and also a sense of, uh, of being not necessarily of this place. Um, so, uh, and the reason uh, Peter calls us exiles here and foreigners is because as followers of Jesus living on earth, we are separated physically from our king and his kingdom. And that should produce in us angst. Um, so today we're going to look at Romans 10, 5 through 15. So I'll give you a, a few minutes to go there, whether you have a, 
an old school paper copy or if you have a phone, either way. Um, by the way, uh, one thing I've realized lately is that it's actually harder to find, it, it takes me longer to find the scripture in, on my phone than it does looking through the pages. Um, I don't know if anybody else finds that. Um, but today we're going to take, uh, when I put this together, Dave gave me one day to fill in for him, and I kept writing and writing and writing and ended up with two sermons. So fortunately, Dave has said, yes, I can, he can put me on again on the rotation. Um, sometime in the next few months, you'll be hearing part two of this, uh, this message on missions. So I guess stay tuned. But today our focus, we're going we're to focus on two things. First of all, what is a missionary? And how are missionaries different from expats and exiles? They are different, by the way. Um, second, how do I take the gospel to those around me? And let me rephrase that. How do I act as a missionary, with a lowercase m, to the people around me? And we'll talk about that here in just a minute. So, um, We'll get to Romans chapter 10, verses 5 through 15 in just a moment, but let me, let me explain a little bit about the differences between these various categories of foreigners, the expatriate, the exile, and the missionary. So um, they all live in places that are not their home, but the, what makes them different is the reason they live in those places. Um, and it, each group is categorized by those reasons. So first of all, the expat is a person who, it, it defined by the Oxford English Dictionary, is a person who lives in a foreign country. Now, oftentimes, that expat is living there for personal choices. So they've chosen a certain profession, and that profession has moved them. Or they are ideal, in some cases, the person is so ideologically uh, upset with what's going on in his or her home country that they move to another country that, where, uh, where, that, where their ideology matches better. Those are, an expat chooses to live in a foreign country. Um, or let's say a, a retiree decides to retire in uh, Barbados or retire in Western Europe. That, that's by their choice. Um, the exile is a person who is compelled to live in a foreign country. Um, someone who, uh, who is, um, is forced to live there by someone else. So often this is a punishment for a crime. And just one example, you all know who Edward Snowden is. He lives in, uh, in Russia right now because he committed what here in the United States we call a crime, which was he leaked classified documents on purpose to the media. So, he, if he ever comes back to the United States, he's going to be tried, and he knows that, so he's living in Russia as an, ex, as an exile. Um, in the Bible, we have examples of exiles. So if you know about Priscilla and Aquila, the married couple, they lived in, they had their home in Rome, but then because of political persecution, the emperor, if I remember right, was Nero at the time, forced all Jews to leave Rome. So they had to pick up their, uh, their entire lives and move to, if I remember right, it's Ephesus. So they were living in Ephesus as expats. Now, the third category is the missionary. So the missionary is a person sent on or engaged in a religious mission abroad. Here the key word is, anybody know it? Sent. Very good. Um, so the English word missionary comes from the Latin word missio, which means sent, one that is sent by someone else. So as we'll see in a moment, missionaries are people who are three things, called by the Holy Spirit, first of all, commissioned and sent by the local church, second, and third, who willingly choose to live in places and cultures that are foreign to them in order to proclaim the gospel to people who have never heard it. So three, as I see it, there are three qualifications, basic qualifications that you have to have to be a missionary. You have to be called by the Holy Spirit, sent by a local church, and, uh, and in order to... Um, 
uh, take the gospel to foreign places, uh, places that are not like where you grew up. Um, so expats and exiles are quite distinct from missionaries because they are not specially called by God or commissioned by the church to preach the gospel. So these are the marks that set missionaries apart. Now, let's look at a couple of examples, both from Scripture and people that you all know uh, as missionaries. Um, so in each case, we'll talk about how, uh, how you at Bridge are involved in sending people in these, uh, these various categories to uh, the mission field. Um, first of all, Paul and Barnabas. Obviously, if we're going to talk about missionaries, we have to mention them. They were the, um, perhaps some of the first missionaries, um, a missionary team of two, uh, two friends that uh, went out and traveled the entire known world sharing the gospel and, um, and planting churches. Um, but they were itinerant missionaries. They didn't stay in one place for very long. I think the longest was uh, for about three years in, I think it was Ephesus. I'm getting all my... Uh, my facts mixed up, but um, uh, at any rate, in Acts 13, two, uh, verses 2 and 3, the Bible tells us that uh, while they, and this is the prophets and teachers at the church in Antioch, were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they, the leaders, laid their hands on Paul and, and Barnabas and sent them off. We see all three attributes happening there. They are, first of all, called by the Holy Spirit. Second, they are commissioned and sent by the local church. And third, we'll see throughout the rest of Acts, they go from place to place to spread the gospel and plant churches. Um, uh, they, so as I said, they spent uh, short amounts of time in one place in order to establish churches and appoint elders in these churches. That actually was their primary goal, to make sure that as they left the churches, they left them in good hands. Um, uh, Acts 14, verse 23, tells us uh, at the end of their missionary journey that that was their goal. They had established elder, or they had appointed elders in each of the churches. Um, so uh, we have a modern-day example of Paul and Barnabas uh, that we as Bridge support. Craig Peters is much like that. He is, I would say, an itinerant missionary that goes from place to place to place um, to, in order to train up uh, elders and pastors to serve in their local contexts. And he does this in... Um, Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, China, Guatemala, and I may be missing a couple of countries there. Um, and so we have right here at Bridge, when you give to the missions fund, we are supporting Paul and, Born, uh, Paul and Barnabas type missionaries. Um, now, while Paul and Barnabas were itinerant missionaries, Titus and Timothy were long-term church planters and pastors. So, Paul sent, there's that word again, missio, Paul sent Titus to Ephesus and Timothy to Crete to establish themselves there for longer terms. Why? In order to shepherd or pastor the churches there. So uh, to address specific issues these churches were struggling with and to raise up elders to lead the congregations once they left. So on one hand, while Paul appointed elders immediately, apparently he found men that were already qualified in those churches that could be appointed. Titus and Timothy, uh, apparently the churches in Crete and uh, Ephesus did not have such qualified men already, and Titus and Timothy took on the job to train them up. Um, and we have examples of... Uh, uh, of uh, missionaries like that that we support here at, um, at Bridge. So first of all, we have the 1016 team, Chris and Monica Clinch, um, who are living long-term in South Asia. They're on home assignment right now, trying to get back there. Um, but their purpose in South Asia is to train up elders and pastors who can lead their congregations. And you hear them talking about three men, and I'm not—I'm forgetting the third man's name, but Shogun and Reggie 
um, uh, they are working with them daily to establish those, um, them as leaders. We also have uh, Scott Rising and, uh, and Kevin Giddings, who are doing the same thing in, uh, in Greensburg, Pennsylvania, starting the For the City Church there. Um, we also have Joel Straup doing the same thing in uh, Tusla with Community Bible Church. Uh, we are involved in each one of their ministries here at Bridge. We are connected with them and we support them. We also support Chad and Eva Frank and Jason and Lindsay Slack, who are staff members at H2O Church, um, the Slacks in the University of Akron and the, the Franks at, at Kent State. Other way around. Flacks at, at Slacks at, um, at a University of Akron and the... Um, and now I'm getting it totally mixed up. Slacks at Kent State and Franks at... Uh, at Akron, um, and they're planting churches there among people who have, uh, among young, uh, university students. Um, we also support Denise Klein at uh, Kent State Navigators, who disciples uh, young people in following Jesus, um, and she actually attends our church here. So when you see Denise, thank you for, uh, thank her for her service. Um, and we also support uh, Dennis Shawhan, Broken Chains, and Lydia's House, um, uh, jail ministry and recovery ministry, uh, assimilation back into society for, um, uh, for, for women as they leave the incarceration, and also Don Brees and South Akron Youth Ministries that, uh, that brings the gospel to inner city youth right here in Akron. Um, and just so you can, oops, so you can see who we're talking about there. There's Craig. I did not put up an image of Chris and Monica because I'm not sure if we can, this is going to go online and I'm not sure if we can um, show their faces. Um, but there's Scott Rising, Kevin Giddings, Joel Straub, Chad and Eva Frank, uh, Jason and Lindsay Slack. And here we have Denise Klein, Dennis and Tam uh, Tamala Shawhan, and Don Brees. Although if you look closely in that image, it's not, I couldn't find an image of Don Brees, but what I did find was bridge people serving at SAYM, which is even better of, a, of an image. Um, so in summary, missionaries like Paul, Barnabas, Titus, and Timothy, and their modern-day counterparts like the missionaries you're looking at here, um, are called by the Holy Spirit to take the gospel to people who have not yet heard it. And they are sent by the church to do kingdom work across cultures, and in some cases, in different countries and different languages. In a sense, they are all patriots, but not patriots for the United States. Instead, they, uh, they are patriots. These brothers and sisters are patriots for the eternal kingdom. And just like Michiganders always talk about Michigan, these people are always talking about the kingdom with everyone they come into contact with. Um, so, understanding that the majority of us in this room are not, let's say, capital M missionaries, uh, officially sent out by a church, um, called by the Holy Spirit to go to a foreign place, um, I, would, I want to pose to you the, the challenge that every one of us in this room, if we have chosen to follow Jesus, we should all be operating as what I'm going to call lowercase missionaries. Every one of us is a missionary in our sphere. Um, so no matter what field, uh, and so let's talk about that here in terms of um, taking the gospel to those, of, uh, those around us. Um, so no matter what field a missionary serves on, their lives are full of challenges and triumphs, just like our lives are. And they get to watch God working uh, to expand his kingdom from a front row seat. Whenever you talk with a missionary, you feel like God's doing amazing things in their ministry, right? If he isn't, then you probably don't want to support that missionary. But does anybody ever feel like, I, you know, I, really, I really wish I could experience that. And I would say we can experience that if we each see ourselves as lowercase missionaries taking the gospel to the people around us. Um, so let's read Paul's thoughts on missions here in Romans 10, 5 through 15. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does, does the commandments shall live by them. 
But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Or we might actually say the gospel in that, uh, in that sense. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call, in him, uh, how, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how, will they, uh, and how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. We are not all called to be missionaries with a capital M. That is, to pick up our lives and move to a foreign country, to learn to speak a foreign language, to adapt to and adopt foreign customs, and to minister and live everyday life in a foreign culture. The people who do this are specially called and equipped by the Holy Spirit to do this kind of kingdom work. But the elders here at Bridge Bible Church, and I, uh, I, we don't normally want to speak for each other, but I know in this element I can speak for Wayne, I can speak for Tom, and I can speak for Pastor Dave. We pray earnestly that God would use Bridge to expand the kingdom by raising up men and women from Bridge right here to be capital M missionaries. We pray that. Um, to, eat, to go to other cultures and other countries to preach the gospel to people who have never heard it. And we ask that you all would join us in praying that God would raise up capital M missionaries from right here within our body. Um, but even though we are not all called to serve as capital M missionaries, we are all called to be involved in missions. Even if you can't go to the mission field, you can support missionaries in many ways, which I'm going to talk about here in a few moments. Also, the Great Commission applies not just to those who are career missionaries, but to all believers. Um, in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Um, and notice in there, there's not a designation for those career missionaries. That is a command that is laid on every church and every believer. Um, so uh, we are all sent out to expand the kingdom by proclaiming the gospel to those around us who have not heard it in our neighborhoods, in our families, in our workplaces, and in our social circles. How much, think about this, how much would the kingdom expand if each one of us saw ourselves as lowercase missionaries to the people around us. Think about that for a moment. The room would be bursting at the seams. Uh, the kingdom would be bursting at the seams, and that would be a good thing. Now, I know that sharing the gospel is often a scary thing. I admit it's scary for me to share it. Um, and when God orchestrates a moment for us to tell others about him, about the good news, how many of us freeze up and we think, I don't know what to say. What do I do in this moment? Um, well, Bridge, brothers and sisters, let me give you some practical uh, advice here. Um, let's look back at Romans 10, 8 through 9. So Paul gives us an encouraging word that I don't want anyone here to miss. He says that if you have Jesus' righteousness, which he imputes to us by faith in him, the word is near you and in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we preach. So if the, if the Holy Spirit is living in you, you already have the words inside you. 
and they are literally on, they should be on the tips of our tongues. Um, so be confident, brothers and sisters. If the Holy Spirit um, lives in you, his word is near you. It is in your mouth. It is in your heart. And here Paul quotes Deuteronomy 30, 14. But the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, so that you can do it. Now, in the Deuteronomy passage, the thing Moses is commanding the Israelites to do is on, to honor the commands God has given them. But in Romans 10, uh, 10 uh, 8, I believe it is, um, Paul uses this Old Testament text to underscore that the gospel is written on our hearts. And as a result, it should also be on the tips of our tongues. But as if this were not enough, Paul followed this verse with what is probably the Bible's clearest and most concise description of the entire gospel message. And only in 26 words. So I'm not very good at scripture memory. I'm going to confess to you right now, but I can remember 26 words. So um, he says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's all you have to remember. In the two things, to confess with your mouth and believe with your heart that God raised him from the dead and whoever you're speaking with can be saved uh, because of those, of those two things. So, church, I would encourage you to memorize this verse. As God brings you the opportunities to share the gospel with others around you, to be a lowercase missionary in your sphere, all you have to remember and all the hearer has to do is confess Jesus as Lord in his life and believe that God raised him from the dead. It is a message the depths of which we will never fully comprehend in this life. But at the same time, a message that is so simple, even it's so, uh, so simple and complete and beautiful that a young child can believe it and do it. Now, you notice the lights lit today, right? And I'm probably going to tear up on this one. Because just this past week, Rosalind Case chose to follow Jesus. And let's see, um, Rosalind is five, right? Does she understand the gospel in its entire depth? No. Do any of us understand the gospel in its entire depth? No. But she understands that she can confess with her mouth and believe with her heart, and she is saved. So when you see Rosalind, tell her that you're glad that she's followed, following Jesus. Um, now, back to my notes. <laughs> um, let's see. Only the one who is called the Word made flesh could describe the gospel in such beautiful, concise, and clear terms. Think about that. Then in verse 10, Paul says, For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. When someone believes in their heart, God imputes his righteousness to them. And when they confess with their mouths that Jesus is Lord, God saves them from their sins and destines them for eternal life with him as his son or his daughter. And in verses 11 and 13, which you can see on the screen here, Paul finishes this presentation of the gospel with two very encouraging notes. In verse 11, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. And in verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Praise to God, brothers and sisters, that there is no sinner that is so far from God that he cannot save him to eternal life. Um, so, as we think about this, this uh, context of missions in terms of the, um, uh, in the, in the, given today as Independence Day, um, we're thinking about patriots, I want to leave you with two application points. Um, 
And then whenever I get to teach you uh, again uh, in the next few months, um, I'll give you the other points. Um, I actually uh, timed my, uh, my sermon yesterday, and it was twice as long as it should be, so I immediately called Dave and said, help me out here. Um, uh, so, um, at any rate, application one. And this is really important here, um, given the divisiveness, the political divisiveness that we see happening in our country now and always, to be honest. Be an expat for the kingdom more than you are a patriot for the United States. There's nothing wrong with being a patriot, but I hope that your true allegiance, your true identity is found as being a citizen of the eternal kingdom. And that uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if as much as we see on Facebook and in other places uh, people talking about their politics, if we were talking about our eternal politics and the ideology of the kingdom, at least as much, if not more, wouldn't that glorify God? Um, so in other words, our, uh, uh, our passion, uh, our promotion of the core values of our country should never eclipse the patriot our patriotism for the kingdom. And our passion for our king and his kingdom should always be infinitely greater than our passion for the American ideal. As followers of Jesus, we must find our core identity first and foremost as citizens of the eternal kingdom. Just like the heroes of faith mentioned in Hebrews, may we also desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. And may we also place our hope only in the king and his kingdom, not in America, not in our political system, not in our earthly leaders. Um, so that's application one. Be an expat for the kingdom more than you are an expat for the United States. Next, that, that's maybe the harder one. Here's the easier one. Be ready to give a reason for the hope that you have. That comes from, uh, from I, uh, that's Paul's writing. Um, and what I want to charge you with is to memorize Romans 10, 9. Uh, 26 words, brothers and sisters, and that gives you what you need to know to be able to share the gospel with who, whenever those moments arise. And I'm going to be doing it with you because I often freeze up too, I'll be honest. Um, so, um, then... Whenever we, uh, I, get to, uh, I get to talk with you again about this, um, I'll do the second part. And in that case, we're going to talk about two ideas, beautiful feet and how God's call to missions impacts every follower of Christ.
that's our prayer there, that God, as we leave this place, that um, God, you would take the things that we have, um, our gifts, our passions, our interests, that you would take all of these things, God, and that we, that uh, you would use them. May our, our feet swift and beautiful and used for you, God. May our intellect be used for you, God. Would you take all of us, God? Here we are, all of us, God. Take our lives, God, and surrender to you. So God, um, just as we leave this place, may we be reminded of what it is uh, that you've done for us, the great freedom, the great grace that we have in you. Maybe we, may we be willing to share that with others. So we pray all of these things in your glorious name.